Let's go ahead and open up in prayer. Dear Lord, uh, we thank you for the time we have been gathered together. Lord, I pray a uh, sense of presence and blessing over this sermon, and that uh, whatever is not of you falls on deaf ears. In Jesus' name, amen. So, um, one of the things that I have surprisingly kind of struggled with uh, in my Christian walk is this term blessing. Uh, you know, I kind of came from a rough background, maybe it's because of that, or maybe it's because I'm becoming more and more aware about issues of injustice that are both happening here and all over the world. Um, whenever someone says that I'm blessed, it makes me wonder what they fully mean by that. Especially when you compare people's lives. Um, I do think I've earned everything I have, but I also recognize that I'm in a position that made it easier for me to get there. Uh, for instance, the reason I am losing a lot of weight is because I have access to quality health care. Uh, the reason why I can have hobbies or even free time is because I have basic things like Wi-Fi and a roof over my head. You know, it's when I recognize those little things uh, that I have access to all these other things because of who I am that makes me wonder what the term blessing really means. So, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to say that, but I have wondered throughout my faith journey what sort of definition God brings to blessing. So when I read the words of Jesus, specifically in the Beatitudes, he kind of flips that. He says that the people who are blessed the most are the people on the margins, the poor, the disenfranchised, the burnt out. So how do we reframe how we be blessings? And in light of Thanksgiving, how do we reframe even thanks? Let's also go ahead and turn to Psalm 27. I'll be reading out of the Common English Bible. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Should I fear anyone? The Lord is a fortress protecting my life. Should I be frightened of anything? When evildoers come at me trying to eat me up, to stay my foes and my enemies who stumble and fall. If an army camps against me, my heart won't be afraid. And if war comes up against me, I will continue to trust in this. I have asked one thing from the Lord, and it's all I seek, to live in the Lord's house all the days of my life, seeing the Lord's beauty, and constantly adoring his temple. Because he will shelter me in his own dwelling during troubling times. He will hide me in a secret place in his own pen. He will set me up high, safe on a rock. Now my head is higher than the enemies surrounding me, and I will offer sacrifices in God's tent, sacrifices with shouts of joy. I will sing and praise the Lord. Lord, listen to my voice when I cry out. Have mercy on me and answer me. Come, my heart says, seek God's face. Lord, I do seek your face. Please don't hide it from me. Don't push your servant aside angrily. You have been my help. God who saves me, don't neglect me. Don't leave me all alone. Even if my father and mother leave me all alone, the Lord will take me in. Lord, teach me your way. Because of my opponents, lead me on a good path. Don't give me over to the desires of my enemies, because false witnesses and violent accusers have taken their stand against me. For I have sure faith that I will experience the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Hope in the Lord. Be strong. Let your heart take courage and hope in the Lord. So whenever, um, a while back I attended a service of a Black Baptist church. So whenever there's an explanation mark, I always kind of feel bad because I don't get enough punction. 
but this is someone really joyful uh, in his circumstances. So here's a little context on the psalm and some interesting details. Uh, the authorship is traditionally seen as David, once again. And the psalm is one of the famous ones that is recited uh, in both Jewish synagogues and churches. Uh, it's a weekly part of Catholic Mass to say this psalm. And in Jewish practice, there are verses from this psalm that are recited twice daily. Uh, there's a reason why this psalm has some punching power when people read it. And it's because it's obviously written during a time when the writer is not in a good position. He's on the run and in hiding. And he has to refocus himself on God. So I always push you need to view the Old Testament uh, not through the lens of a surface meaning, but through the lens of Jesus. Because the ultimate character and display of God's character is Jesus. So let's see what Jesus has to say um, about this. So in the Gospels, the psalmist is exactly the kind of person Jesus would say was blessed because he is especially closer to God's heart. In Matthew 5, 3 through 4, Jesus says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Uh, that's from the New King James Version. In the Common English Bible, it says, Happy are people who are hopeless, because the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Happy are people who grieve, because they will be made glad. So why the word difference in translation? Uh, in the original Greek, it actually means both things. Uh, it means both happy and kind of being shown favor. Uh, my take on it is that Jesus is giving both a present promise, but also a future promise. That the blessing they will receive in the future is a blessing that says kind of a quote revelation, that God will wipe away every tear and make all things right. So you have to keep in mind that Jesus wasn't speaking to 21st century Americans. He was speaking to people who were starving. He was speaking to people who were facing oppression. So the kingdom of God, uh, according to Jesus, highlights these people on the margins and says, these are the people that are close to God's heart. The poor and the hurting are people God is especially with. So that's, I believe, that a blessing in view of what Jesus says is something similar to the psalm. That out of a poor and destitute place within ourselves, we can recognize God's presence. Uh, the kingdom of God is upside down, meaning that the first will be last and the last will be first. Uh, the strong and powerful do not seem to impress God. And if we're going by the Western definition of what it means to be strong and powerful, it doesn't seem to mean anything to God. So when we label people who have an abundance of material possessions as being blessed, um, I think there's a danger in mistaking of where God's heart is at. Um, where God's heart is at, that's where we want to be as Christians. Um, there's a book that's really edgy and controversial, so of course I love it. Um, I don't know, I love a rebel spirit. But uh, it's called Rich Christians in an Age of Hunger uh, by Ron Sider. Uh, the book caused quite the stir uh, because he called on Christians to radically give up themselves to the poor and to change the way they view their faith. Uh, here's a quote from it, and just to kind of give you a glimpse of what it says. It says, God thundered again and again through the prophets that worship in the context of mistreatment of the poor and disadvantage is an outrage. So it's a really convicting book, and that's just a glimpse, but just check it out if you have the space for it right now. But going kind of off of that controversial book, um, I cannot tell you how many times someone has accused me of missing the point of the gospel uh, because I believe in pushing to serve the poor and for social justice. Um, the thing is that when I read the words of Jesus, and when I read those 4,000 verses about poverty, and God's heart for the hurting, I don't understand how I can feel any differently. As a pastor, I think it's kind of my job to point these things out, out and ask, where do we go from here? 
So if you're misunderstanding what it means to believe, blessed, I think we have missed a vital calling on our lives to be a part of God's blessing to people who need us the most. Uh, there's no greater joy in my own Christian walk than to be part of that blessing for people. There was a guy a while back uh, whose name I can't immediately remember. And uh, he had become a Christian through a Quaker prison ministry somewhere around Kansas. And uh, he turned out to know a mutual friend because the Quaker world is really small. But he looked up Quakers in Wisconsin, and of course, you know, there's one of two churches that he knew. But he said he was on his way to Minnesota to meet his girlfriend. Uh, he had just been freshly released from prison. And that all he needed was soap and some extra cash. So after work at the club, I drove to the Dells, picked that up, and gave him some extra money. So when I went to go meet him, the first two things he said were, wow, you're really tall. And then he said, I really like your curly hair. And so uh, after I gave him those things, as I was about to drive away out of habit, I said, good luck. And he said, I don't believe in luck. I believe in being blessed like tonight. I haven't heard from him since then, but that statement had a huge effect on me. It doesn't take much to be a blessing for other people. I don't show this to brag, but to show you that it's often easier than you think to love people in pain and on the margin. We have this stigma in our society that says we need to stay away from those kinds of people. But God often calls us the other direction to get in our mess. And as Christians, we have the responsibility to be a blessing in that way. A blessing meaning that we can be a part of God's presence with everyone. So if you're, here's the good news. If you're not feeling this yet, if you're in pain, if you're financially struggling, if you're feeling that emptiness of the season, know that Jesus is with you in more ways than you can realize. Jesus knows what it's like to be in pain, what it's like to be afraid, what it's like to even be in poverty. Something I find interesting is that for 30 years, Jesus said mostly nothing in his ministry. There was that one time when he was 12 where uh, he wandered off from his parents. But other than that, his reported silence, for lack of a better word. So that means he was in his community, um, experiencing the same kinds of oppressions and witnessing the same kind of terrible things as neighbors were witnessing. We, meaning uh, broadly Protestant, um, if you want to call it that, it's complicated, but often like to highlight that Jesus is God. But I think we tend to forget that we should also highlight the humanity of Jesus. That we can find someone that knows what it's like to suffer. And that's a beautiful thing to me. The fantastic news is that we're not alone. Because it means the God who fearfully and wonderfully made us is with us today. This holiday season may be rough, but we have confidence in knowing that we have a friend. We need to hold on to hope that things will get better someday. That's what will keep us going when things get tougher than we can imagine. One of my favorite theologians uh, is named Julian of Norwich. Uh, she wrote the first book uh, in English that would be written by a woman. Uh, she was a Christian mystic who often spent time with God throughout her thoughts. Uh, her book is called Reve Revelations of Divine Love. So she wrote it after profound spiritual experience. So she wrote, if there is anywhere on earth a lover of God who is always kept safe, I know nothing of it. For it was not shown to me. But this was shown, that in falling and rising again, we are always kept in that same precious love. We don't know what tomorrow brings, but we do know that God loves us and that we are in his heart. And we can know that through the way Jesus interacts with the least of these. The final verse of this psalm expresses it well. Hope in the Lord, 
be strong. Let your heart take courage. Let's hold on to that, both to God, but also to each other, even at a distance. Because in the end, we know that God loves us dearly. And there's no better place to be than in his heart. Let's go ahead and thus be a part of the blessing to other people. Let's go ahead and close in prayer and then sing in our hearts, O Lord, you have been good. Dear Lord, I thank you uh, for being present with us. And let us always be reminded that we are in your heart, both in thought and in your both in thought and in our dear immediate presence. Lord, we lift up those who are having a hard time this holiday season. Those of us. Be present with us and uh, always walk alongside us wherever we go. In Jesus' name.